Great. So welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Monica Walker, and on behalf of the Global Initiative for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Curling, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to um, our celebration of the International Day for Sport and Development and Peace. Um, so happy, happy April 6th, everyone. Um, we have a very special webinar planned today. Um, like I said before, we'll be taking questions towards the end. So please um, send them in the chat, send them in the Q&A box as you think of them. Um, but we'll, we'll be doing that at the end. Uh, so today, first, we're gonna have Marianne just share a little bit more about curling if you're, if you're not familiar with our sport. Um, and then she'll explain a little bit more about what the International Day for Sport and Development and Peace is in case you don't know. Um, next, we're gonna be showcasing a very special initiative called United We Curl by Goldline Curling. And Erin Flowers from <clears throat> Goldline will be explaining the initiative. And we also have Andrew Paris here today, who's a partner of the initiative who will um, speak to us. And finally, um, Marianne will wrap everything up and we'll take some questions. Um, so without further ado, Marianne, the floor is yours and I'll share my screen. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Monica. I'm Mariam bardot benchik and I'm a social scientist, a researcher of sport and uh, social sciences, and a curling enthusiast and a pastime curler myself. So as Monica mentioned before, today is the uh, UN recognized day of uh, sports contribution to peace building, peacekeeping, and international development. In short, it's the IDSDP, the International Day of Sport for Development and Peace. We can uh, move one slide, Monica, please. So yeah, what is Sport for Development and what is the International Day of Sport for Development and Peace about? So the United Nations in 2013 recognized uh, the uh, sports contribution, a uh, possible contribution to reaching the so-called sustainable development goals, which are 17 global goals, which are to be obtained by 2030, and they are to to make the world a better place. They include uh, goals such as ending poverty or contributing to the fight against climate change or building strong and just institutions. And uh, as the UN recognized the importance of sport uh, in uh, this uh, fight for these goals, they proclaimed the 6th of April to be an awareness raising day of this sport for development and peace movement. So uh, today is actually the seventh international day of sport for development and peace. And uh, in the past years, there were numerous different campaigns on-site and online events uh, to showcase the power of sport in creating social change. This picture was actually taken two years ago at the World Men's Curling Championship, where uh, we were uh, uh, curling players were asked to pose with the icons of the Sustainable Development Goals. And here's one of the most successful curling players today, Oscar Eriksson from Sweden, posing with actually all 17 goals. We can uh, move on slide, Monica. Uh, and just briefly, how you can imagine what sport can do to contribute to these global goals. Um, the Sport for Development and Peace movement is actually using uh, sport as a tool uh, to contribute to these goals in various ways. It can be used as a core of a programming and through sport, you can teach different life skills, different uh, different positive attitudes uh, to participants. Uh, and of course, it can include not only sports, but all types of physical activities, such as fun plays, dances, yoga, and uh, such. Or the other hand, you can actually use sport as only a flypaper to educational and awareness raising uh, campaigns. For instance, the education about various uh, disease prevention methodologies and so on. So actually you, sport can be used as a hook as well to invite potential participants to these uh, initiatives. And uh, a couple of uh, words about curling, if we can move one slide, Monica. 
because we are talking today about a Curling for Social Inclusion project, which is a really, really unique initiative with a winter sport called curling. It's an Olympic winter sport that is uh, played uh, between two teams of uh, two or four players, depending on the format that you're playing. And it's actually uh, throwing really heavy granite stones and a really long sheet of ice to a special target uh, on the ice surface, which is called the house. Now, following various uh, tactics and uh, strategic elements, the main goal is to score as many points in one part of the game uh, as you can, of course, uh, by uh, placing as many stones closest to the center of uh, this uh, bull's eye painting on the ice than your opposing team. Uh, curling has really special equipment, including curling shoes, curling gloves, and the so-called broom. Now, as you can see on the pictures, the broom has various functionalities in this sport. First of all, if you slide on this really slippery sheet of ice, it can help you balance your move. On the other hand, you can use the broom's bright head as a target, so your throwing uh, player uh, teammate can more easily target the place where uh, he or she is shooting for. And finally, as you can see, uh, as the two gentlemen are cleaning the ice in front of that uh, blue uh, stone, it's because in this case they try to alter the route that the stone um, travels by heating the ice surface before it uh, with really uh, fast moves which heats the ice and it's all done by this curling equipment which is called the broom. Now, the United V Curl project by Cold Line Curling and its partners is all around these brooms. So now I let Erin Flowers and Andrew Paris uh, talk to us about why this uh, United V Curl project is so unique and what they do with the brooms in it to create a sport for social inclusion. Erin, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Yes, um, it's an exciting day. I just uh, just want to say hello, everyone. I want to thank you for taking your time out of your day to tune into this webinar. Andrew and I are both very grateful for this opportunity to share with you all. It's a, it's a big day for all sport. I, uh, I'm just going to jump right in I, uh, with a little background on myself. Uh, who am I um, and who's the company? My name's Erin Flowers, and my grandfather started this little curling company over 50 years ago. My father took over the business when I was quite young, and I, I basically had front row seats to the reality of running a small business in Canada for many years. I began working full time with the company about 20 years ago, and um, my father retired in 2018, and I now run the company with two great men, Andrew Brett and Pete Townsend. I have to admit, nothing connects you more with your business partners than a global pandemic. I, uh, COVID has taken its toll on recreational sport um, really as a whole in Canada, but we're grateful to keep our head above water in this niche market. We're stronger than ever and a lot of that has to do with why I'm here today. Um, back in June 2020, our uh, company made a statement acknowledging we haven't done enough to make this sport safe for racial, racialized persons. Our values aligned as an ownership group and we set out to make change and committed to moving forward no matter what. We were gifted with Dr. Richard Norman, who continues to guide us in this space. The timing of Dr. Richard coming on board was extremely helpful as the topic for his PhD, which he completed on January 2020, was on diversity and curling. And his research was fresh and, and painfully accurate. It became evident, especially through this pandemic, that Canada is made up of small businesses just like ours. And as the fall of 2020 approached, we were pretty much in survival mode, but we kept pushing to take steps forward to change the face of curling. I was reading articles about companies, big, small, and micro size that were making change and not just making hollow statements. It was about social accountability. And if we as a company are going to take, are, are going to talk about change, then we really need to live it. And um, for those of you who know curling, um, as Marianne did, did explain, it's, it's the brush is uh, one of the most prominent pieces of equipment in the sport. It's four feet long and it has a one and one eighth circumference of space. 
1998, curling became an official Olympic sport and the branding on a brush is by far one of the more memorable pieces of equipment you'll ever see on TV. I knew these were the perfect billboards to help us on this journey to understand what is important in these communities and that have been left out of the sport we love. I've been grateful over the years to meet some incredible people in my business travels. I right away can think of three passionate curlers I would love to see create these brushes. I was on a Zoom call and I virtually met a gentleman named Andrew Paris. I was immediately intrigued and captivated by his voice on this subject of race in our sport. He knew, he knew what was important and I wanted to know more. I also met a young man, Graydon, at a curling event in Yorkton, Saskatchewan in January, 2020. Graydon's passion for the sport of curling was evident and he came into our booth to buy his shoes. He has a story and I wanted to amplify it on a brush in every way possible. Deb Martin is a curler from New, New Jersey. If you've met Deb or you've been in a room with Deb, you already know how incredible she is. Her love of the game is beautiful and so is her drive to see the sport change for the better. It's been something, sorry, it has been some of the most meaningful work of my career as I continue to spend time with these three amazing individuals in this process of designing these brushes and seeing what's inside of them come to life on this canvas kind of known as, as the curling product in a brush. We see this product as a gift and educational piece to the curling community. Therefore, all proceeds of these brushes will go back to the projects, charities, or initiatives each individual chooses as they grow the sport in their respected communities. In February, we are proud to announce United We Curl as our overall initiative that will work closely to amplify the voices of racialized persons in curling. And now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce one of our partners, Andrew Paris. Oh my goodness, Aaron, you are, you are far too kind. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk about, talk about the Broom Initiative and what's next. I'm really excited to share that. So let me just share my screen here right quick. Let's see here, let's see technology works for me though. There we go, so far so good. You can do it. There we go. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Unite We Curl, about my particular broom design. We're going to talk about what it is. I'm not going to reveal it necessarily today. We're going to talk about why it's important. We're going to talk about what's next and how we're going to accomplish what exactly is next. So a little bit about me. I've been curling for about 25 years. I've spent 14 of those years coaching. I spent a lot of time in the develop, on the development administrative side of sport. So I was the former junior program director with the Dartmouth Curling Club here in Nova Scotia. And I was also the former technical director with Nova Scotia Curling for a few years. I also still volunteer my time as a sport and recreation consultant to a variety of curling clubs, but also sport other sports other than curling and also work a little bit with um, Sport Nova Scotia too with some of their funding initiatives that they have going on. So I won't get into it too too much but this is essentially the curling broom we refer to the curling broom or the curling brush this here on your screen is essentially what it is that we're referring to. So like Aaron said um, we chatted this would have been back in the fall of 2020 about designing this curl room to um, to bring a voice to um, my particular community to on um, the black Nova Scotian community black Canadian community and how we can amplify that to start a conversation. So part of the reason why we chose the curling room is it's the piece of equipment that everyone uses regardless of their skill level or their experience. The curling room itself, really excited to reveal here in the next few weeks. There's different symbols and stories on it. The whole piece of equipment tells a story from end to end. So this is more, in my mind anyway, this is more of an educational piece. So that when you see it out there on the ice, you, know, you look at it and say, what's that? And then that tells a story. Or if you want to learn more about something in particular, we have a mechanism on the broom itself to go to the Unite We Curl website to learn more about that particular community or to learn more about the conversation. 
And that's the most important part of all of this is that it creates a conversation. For those who aren't so familiar with curling, it's a, it's a very white sport. Let's just be blunt and put it out there. The majority of the people who play our sport are white. Um, at, for most of my curling career, if you want to call it a career, um, I'm usually the only black person on the ice which creates a whole variety of issues, both positive and negative, that we're gonna get into during, our, during this presentation. So on your screen right now, we have a variety of communities. Some you may have heard of, maybe you've never heard of any of them. But what these are, these are six, both current and former black communities here in Canada and their names are prominently displayed along with 24 other communities on the broom itself. So a big part of the story of the broom is to talk about these communities and how that they play into our history and how we can invite people from these communities to come on out to the curling club. So like I said, we, we have 30 of them in total. Perhaps you've never heard of the bog. So the bog is in PEI. It's a former, former black community in PEI. Perhaps you've never heard of Africville. Africville is a community in Halifax, Nova Scotia, that actually was demolished in the process of building the McKay Bridge. So we want to talk about the history of these communities, both the positive and the negative side, because it's a very important conversation to have. It's a very important educational piece. So actually, let me just back up here for a second. Well, what's going to happen is once this broom is released, a part of the proceeds are going to go to the initiative that I'm going to introduce to you for the first time today. So why we need an initiative, we really want to change the image of curling. So like I said, it's very much a sport that's played by mostly white people. Not that there's anything inherently wrong with that, but in the black community, whether, whether we like it or not, curling is perceived as a rich sport for white people. So a very high class sport. We as curlers know that that's not necessarily the case, but we need to start a conversation in order to change that image. We also want our curling communities to have stronger links within the community. And the only way to do that is to diversify your membership within your club. The initiative that I'm working on is going to create learning opportunities for the management of the curl clubs, for the volunteer board of directors, and for the members themselves. We really want not only start conversation, but we want you to learn. We want we want everybody at the curl club to be to get to be educated along the way here. Also, we want the curl clubs to be a more sustainable organization. Not every curl club, but most curl clubs are struggling for members. We want to be able to give them the tools to be able to market to the BIPOC community in general, because as a active BIPOC community, then the, through working with them, through having conversations with them, they'll be able to bring in more members over time and their current club will be able to last another 50, 100 years into the future. And that gets into the financial benefits, of course, with the increased membership also, here in Nova Scotia in particular, the more diverse your club is, the more opportunities that you have for additional funding. So through a, pro through a program that I'm part of called Sport Funds through Sport Nova Scotia, one of the questions that we ask those who we give funding to is, um, does your does your um, opportunity, does your initiative, does your club in this particular case serve a diverse community? Right now, let's just be blunt, current clubs don't. I know that tends to be a tough pill for those in the current community to solve, but we simply don't. However, there's no better time than the present to get started. We can't change what has happened in the past. 
we're not necessarily focused on what's happened in the past. We need to tell the story of where we've been, but I'm more focused on helping curling clubs get to the future. Why haven't we been successful in the past? Well, like we talked about, there's the image of the sport. There's also barriers to the sport for those who look like me. So those who know me know that I'm a pretty laid back guy. I'm a pretty outgoing kind of guy. Through my job and through my opportunities, I've been able to visit dozens and dozens of curling clubs, not only throughout Nova Scotia, but throughout Canada. Do you want to know how many I've been welcomed into? The answer is four. Four curling clubs. Usually what happens when I walk into a curling club is I get a look of what are you doing here? Or there's some confusion as to why has this black man walked into the curling club? That's usually what I, that's usually the reaction that I get. There's nobody at the door saying, no, you can't come in. That's never happened. But the looks I get, the reactions I get, it's, 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 it's a variety of things. It's, it's sad, it's depressing, but I've loved the sport from the, the age that I could, could walk. You know, my mother tells me about how I was sliding soup cans across the floor in diapers with a little circle for a house that she taped it on the floor. But as you can imagine, somebody who's never experienced crime before, and you walk into the club, you walk in onto the ice, you see nobody who looks like you. And on top of that, when you walk in, there's that confusion as to what you're doing here. In fact, one curling club I went into, who we shall not mention their name, I walked in and they said, oh, you walked into the wrong entrance, the mall's over there. That's a true story. So you can imagine that right now, like I said, there's no physical barriers to the BIPOC community going into a curling club. There's very much invisible barriers. As curling clubs, some of them, if we're being blunt, just have a lack of motivation towards diversifying the clubs. There are very few, but we know that that problem exists. Um, why this hasn't worked in the past? Perhaps there's a lack of a marketing plan. How do we market to these communities? A lot in my history, when we have this discussion, whether it's board of directors or curl club managers, they say, oh, well, you're black. Here, why don't you go into the community and make our clubs more diverse? Here's the thing about diversity and racism in general. It's not the minority's job to fix the problem. 100% willing to help, 100% willing to do what I can, but it's not our job to fix racial issues. And that's a big challenge that we have in general, not just specifically in Caroline, but that generally exists. There's been a lack of collaboration. So collaboration on a number of fronts. First off, there hasn't been collaboration with the community. And what I mean by that is I have relatives who live in East Preston. It's one of the largest black communities here, not only Nova Scotia, but in the entire country. And one of the things that my aunt was telling me about is she says every February during Black History Month, we have all kinds of different sports, all kinds of different initiatives that enter the community. They come in and say, we want to do this. We want to do this, all kinds of different things. But then once March 1st hits and Black History Month is over, if that initiative, if that program hasn't gained any traction, well, out it goes and then it comes back again. Maybe it comes back again, maybe it does, but then it comes back around next February. We need to recognize that if we are to be successful at this, it's going to take time, it's going to take genuine conversations with those communities. 
to understand things such as their history, for example, which part, which the broom that we're going to launch is going to explain a bit of. But just having a conversation to show that you genuinely care about making our clubs more diverse. We generally care about some of the issues that Black people face, that Indigenous people face, that all the BIPOC community faces when even just getting to a sporting facility. Those issues, they may be some things that you never think of, such as transportation, for example, such as the financial side of it, such as the invisible barriers and why that's important that those don't exist at all when you first approach your current club. The other side of collaboration too that has been a barrier is there's been a lot of people in a lot of different areas doing their own thing, right? So we have the great work that DEI is doing. We have the great work that USA Curling has recently started. Curling Canada has also started to have conversations with a bit of work. But everybody's sort of off doing their own thing. This is a huge challenge that we face. And it's extremely important that we don't need necessarily need to work together. We don't need to hold hands and be best friends. It's not, it doesn't need to be about that. But we need to share things like best practices or lessons learned or struggles that we've noticed through having those conversations with the communities. It's really important that we try to come together and challenge this all together as a whole as best as we can. And then another reason why we've struggled with this in the past is a lack of resources. Let's be honest, our Chrome Clubs is wonderful people within the Chrome Clubs. Our Chrome managers, they're great people but we ask a ton of them. We ask them to get the ice done. We ask them to put, to put league draws together. We ask them to put bond spiel schedules together. We're pulling them in a bunch of different directions. We need to be able to provide them with the resources to really make this happen. Even something as simple as diversity training. Here, to be able to provide club managers and those volunteer boards with just diversity is a huge step in the right direction. Another thing that we struggle with in the past is we really struggle as a sport to think outside the box. Just not even specifically as it relates to diversity initiatives, but as it relates to marketing in general, a lot of our clubs still do the traditional open house and hope people show up. Again, if nobody that, if we number one, perceive curling to be a rich white sport, and number two, when you show up at the club, there's nobody that looks like you, why would any diverse community just randomly show up? And it's not to say that it doesn't happen. There's people who are here with us today who are diverse and they are within the curling club and that's awesome but we want our current clubs to truly reflect what our country looks like. The biggest barrier in my mind of why we haven't been successful yet is the wall. And what I mean by the wall is when we start to have true meaningful conversations about why our current clubs are not diverse and what we have to do about it, there's a sense of guilt that comes over people. There's a sense of, we don't know where to turn next. There's a sense of, I don't want to actually say what I'm thinking or understand why this is an issue for fear that I'll offend somebody. That is what I call the wall. God bless Peggy, the curling volunteer who's been on part of the board forever and a day. And she's the loveliest person in the whole wide world. She's the nicest person that can be. However, Peggy may accidentally say the wrong thing. And that's okay. That's truly okay. We need, as, a, as part of the Bible community, we need not to judge Peggy in the same way 
that we need Peggy not to judge us when we walk into the curling club. But there's a wall there. There's a lot of uncomfortableness to get through that. A lot of the clubs that I've worked with in the past on various initiatives, they stop at that wall of uncomfortableness. And then it doesn't go from there. And then most of all, we haven't taken all these things and merged them together as one. It has been the all-in approach. The only way you're truly going to make clubs more diverse is if you talk to the current clubs, find work through those barriers, as well at the same time, work with the communities, introduce curling to them in a variety of different ways. And then eventually, slowly but surely, you'll bring everything together. But again, it takes time. So with that said, I am really excited to announce today the Black Rock Initiative. This is a Canadian not-for-profit that I'm starting to link those curling clubs together with the BIPOC community to ensure that our sport can thrive. Our mission is very simple. We want to introduce BIPOC youth to the sport of curling while providing curling clubs with the support and resources necessary to be successful and to be able to become diverse and to be able to come, become the pillars of the community that they once were back in the day. And some still are, and congrats to those curling clubs that still are, by the way. But in order to continue that, we need to make the clubs more diverse. Now, if you take a look at your screen there, there at the top, there's the BIPOC communities. At the bottom, there's the curling clubs. But one of the things is there's a bunch of stuff that's in the middle. We can't just, it's not just as simple as, oh, we talked to the BIPOC community. Oh, we talked to the curling club. And now, it, it, we're all going to live in harmony. We're all going to live happily ever after, like you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. There's a few steps along the way. So in order for this initiative to be successful, we need six what I call groups or pillars in order to make this happen. We, the Black Rock Initiative, need to work with the existing initiatives. We need to learn about the work that they've already done, not to criticize it. Sure, we're not going to criticize it, but to learn the lessons that they've gone through. To pick, piggyback, for lack of a better term, on some of the work that they've gone through. We also need to work with our education partners. And by our education partners, I'm referring to our schools, for example. Within each of the schools, they've done work with diversity already with the, with the BIPOC communities. We have here in Nova Scotia, we have opportunities to partner with our local Department of Education to have another avenue to introduce curling to these communities. We also need to work with our sport partners. So, you know, when our local member associations, such as Nova Scotia Curling, we need to work specifically with our provincial sport partners, such as Sport Nova Scotia here locally, for example. We need to work with our NSOs, our national sport organizations. So whether it's USA Curling in the States, whether it's Curling Canada here, or in our case, one of the partners that we already have on board is the Grand Slam of Curl, we're working with them. We're gonna work with them to reveal the broom and to really kickstart this conversation. We also need to partner with community organizations who are already in the community, already working with the BIPOC community. They're already working to, excuse me, sorry. They're already working to make sure that kids in the BIPOC community are exposed to a variety of different things. For example, some of the work that has been done within the schools and within the Boys and Girls Club locally has inspired my son to be a firefighter. 
that's really awesome. It's something that he, he's gun ho to do. And it's to work like that. We want to be able to partner with those communities to introduce curling. If we need business partners on board. So we are excited to be working with business partners such as Goldline Curling, for example, on the design of the broom. We have a variety of other business partners who, that we're going to announce here over the coming weeks to really help kickstart this initiative. And then last, and certainly not least, and some might argue it's the most important part, we need community allies. I know I talked a lot about the doom and gloom of current clubs and why we struggled in the past, but we know that there are some really good people within these curling clubs who really do want to see change. We have some of them who are here on this webinar today. We need you more than ever to really make this happen. So when we take those six pillars, those six boxes and put them together, that's, those are all the groups that we need to ensure that the curling clubs they are on the bottom, and just because you're on the bottom doesn't mean you're not important. Down there on the bottom, in order to link the two of them together. This isn't just something as simple as I'm gonna hop in my car and go to Cherry Brook and then go to the Dartmouth Crown Club and through two conversations, we're gonna put everything together and everybody's gonna live happily ever after. So into the how, we're gonna start in the upcoming season, working, so we're gonna start with the Black Nova Scotian community to develop relationships and create opportunities to introduce youth in the community of the curl. So we're looking at doing things such as the rocks and bringing in the rocks and wings program that already exists. To even just to talk about the sport of curling. I know for a fact that there's people in these communities who despite the exposure that curling has gotten from the Olympics, despite curling being on TV more and more, have never heard the sport at all. And the little bit that they've heard of the sport is that you're sliding around these big things on ice. So we want to start and develop that relationship, develop, tell about the fun side of curling, the social side of curling. At the same time, we're also gonna be developing relationships with our indigenous population, with our First Nations here in Nova Scotia and new Canadians to Nova Scotia. As well, we want to use existing partnerships within the sport and create new and creating and fostering new relationships. So again, it's a lot about not even the sport itself, but it's a lot about developing relationships, introducing the initiative, introducing how fun sport is in general, but specifically curling. On the curling club side, what we want to do, actually, sorry, I almost missed this slide. Once um, we um, introduce these BIPOC youth to curling, we want to follow up with opportunities to try the sport, leading to a modified learn to curl session specifically for their community. Why do we want to go about this from this perspective? What we've seen locally, we've seen hockey try this. We've seen soccer try this. Recently, swimming, swim Nova Scotia try this. We know that this is an effective model, but we know that we have a lot of barriers to break down in the community in order to get to a point where we can start to see success and success for us. It just starts by having those kids come into the ice. We know curling isn't for everybody, but we also know that once you get kids out into the ice, sliding around, throwing rocks up and down the sheet, it's a ton of fun and you wanna come back and try it again. That doesn't mean that we necessarily, that the community is necessarily, has the next Rachel Holman per se or the next Jennifer Jones, but we don't know if we don't try. Now, going back to the curling clubs, we need to work with them 
to explore where they are currently as it relates to diversity. Perhaps some of these current clubs have never talked about diversity before. We need to provide support with them to do the heavy lifting and breaking through the wall. So the heavy lifting, again, we go back to our club managers, to those volunteers who run the curling clubs. They have a lot on their plate. There's a lot of work here that needs to be done that our initiative is going to help provide them, such as setting up these, op these on ice opportunities being able to provide the instruction. So rather than have the club look for a bunch of volunteers to work with this instruction, we're already going to be able to provide them for them. The work of making sure that the kids get to the curl club, that's going to be, you know, as my mother would say, a chore and a half. We want to be able to provide that support to get them there. And then of course, the breaking through the wall. There's a lot of uncomfortable conversations that we need to have with curling clubs to get to a point where not only are they comfortable with having the BIPOC community come into their club, but also um, the BIPOC community themselves going into the club, right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done on that end. We want to provide resources to the club to ensure that they're more welcome to the, to the BIHA community. So we talked about diversity training earlier. We want to be able to provide clubs with diversity, true diversity training, not just clicking through an online training tool and having it pop at the other end, oh, you're certified. No, true diversity training so that they understand a bit more of what does the world, what does the curl club look like through my eyes or somebody who looks like me? So we talked about diversity training, we talked about having those conversations and those reasons. We want to be able to provide them for, ideally free of charge or for a limited cost. We want to keep, create capacity within the club to ensure a more welcoming environment. So what that means is we want to ensure that we have leaders within the club who will run with the torch long after the initiative leaves. It doesn't mean that here's the tools, I'm out of here, I'm done. No, but we also recognize that in order for the program to expand from one end of the country to the other, that we need to create capacity within each of the clubs because we simply just can't be in, say, a club in Halifax, Nova Scotia one day, and then the very next day be in a club in Oakville, Ontario. It's just not realistic. So we want to create the capacity for these current clubs so that the club continues to become more and more diverse long after we leave. And then we are going to create a tool for clubs to go through so that they can proudly display to the world that they are a certified Black Rock Initiative club. That's something that you can proudly display. We're looking to work with our support partners to ensure that such a certification is meaningful, something that you can proudly display within your club. So when? Well, we're going to get started now. We've already been doing some work with Goal Line, like we talked about, to promote the broom. That's going to kickstart a conversation. We're aiming to start working with some Nova Scotia clubs this fall. We hope to expand elsewhere in Atlantic Canada by mid next year, so mid 2022. And then within a couple of years of that, within 18 to 24 months, we want to expand to the rest of Canada. We, we had talked about, initially talked about the United We Curl initiative with Devin Haru and Colleen Jones with CBC. The amount of feedback and positive feedback that we got back from clubs across the country was super exciting. We know that eventually we can expand this across the country. We know that the interest is there. 
And like I said, we definitely believe we can expand this across the country. The reason why there's such a gap that we're not starting everywhere now is we need to ensure that we incorporate feedback from all six main groups, but especially the BIPOC community to ensure that we're creating a long lasting impact. We don't want to rush this. It's not a matter of here's our checklist and we'll just check it out box after box after box. And like I talked about earlier, we really need to ensure that in order for this to grow successfully, that we really need to make sure that we create capacity so that we have leaders in each of the regions that we go into to ensure that not only these modified learning the curls run successfully, but long after the Black Rock Initiative leaves, that diversity can flourish for many years to come. So one of the pillars that we talked about were community allies. They're extremely important. So you may be on this webinar today, or there may be somebody who learns about an initiative and says, I'm not a member. I'm, I'm not a member of the BIPOC community. How can I help? Or how can I be of assistance? Or what can I do? We need you to speak up. We need you to stand up. So when you see somebody making a joke, for example, about, about that black person in the club, that's not tolerant. And you don't, you need to speak up right then and there to let, to let them know that it's not tolerated. We need your support. We need you to spread the message about what it is that we're doing. We're not even talking about straight up financial support. Although once the broom comes out, shameless plug, it would be awesome if you purchase it. Not only because the funds of those go to the work that we're doing, but because the broom that's out there, once you see it, there's no way you can look at it and say, oh, I'm not a crown room and turn away. It's going to start a conversation. And as we travel to more of these crown clubs, we need you to volunteer. And it can be something as simple as you're at the door, you're holding the door open and welcoming people as they come into your club. That's something that should be done across the board, by the way. Like this isn't something that's limited or special to the BIPOC community. That's something that should be happening across the board. But again, because of those invisible barriers that we talked about earlier, it's extremely important that we have those sort of things in place to make sure that the BIPOC community knows that they are welcome there, that they belong there, that we are happy as current clubs to have them, to have you there. Simply put, we can't do this without these community allies. So you, again, going back to what I was talking about earlier, you may look back at that and say, oh, what can I do to help? There's, there's nothing that I can do. We can't do this without you. And like I said, most of all, this will take time. This isn't something where we're gonna start and then magically within three months, all the problems are gonna be solved. And then by the beginning of next year, our clubs are gonna reflect what our country truly looks like. This is going to take time. And I encourage you to be patient as we work through this together. A couple of things I tell my athletes that I work with that is also extremely important for this, you need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because like I said, the wall, it's the biggest challenge that we face. There's going to be some uncomfortable feelings. You need to get used to those feelings, accept them for what they are. You not only will your current club grow, but you will also grow as a person. And this, this is something that I actually have posted in my office at work. Will it be easy? Nope. Will it be worth it? Absolutely. And this is what keeps me driving every single day. Before we go, I need to quickly say thank you to a few people. First off, my wife, Jen, she puts up with me acting crazy all the time. Or me running, yeah, she, look, she, she just, just rolled her eyes right now. 
or she was, does this look good? Does this make sense to you? I had all hours of the night, so I can't thank her enough. To Aaron Flowers and the entire team at Goldline, it's been an honor working with you guys. I can't wait to see what we accomplish further. To the Global Initiative for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Curling, the DEI Curling Group, you guys have been a huge support. Very proud and impressed with the work that you're doing. Look forward to working with you in the future, and thank you for having me today. To Rich, Rich is a mentor to me. He's done a lot of work in this field. I can't thank him enough for everything they've done, including um, the work that he's done in Logo that we're going to reveal in a minute. Monica, she takes texts from me at very random times, even when she, I know she's on the ice trying to train to make it to the Olympics. She's helped with a lot of work that we've done, so thank you, Monica. And then Janessa McPherson, who works with Sport Nova Scotia, she's helped me a lot with some of the administrative stuff with like getting this not-for-profit up and running, so I can't thank her enough. So with that, that's our logo there. Follow us. We have Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook up and running. We are soon going to have our website up and running. Be sure to follow us. Be sure to tell your friends about us because this isn't a drop in the bucket, boys and girls. We're here to stay and we're here to make lasting change. So with that, I'm going to throw it back to Monica so that she can take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Marianne, did you wanna do a, a closing for um, April 6th? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Erin and Andrew, for this great presentation of United We Curl. Now, as I've mentioned to you, I'm a researcher, and in research, we take a really critical look at these sorts of sport for inclusion, sport for education initiatives. And I did it. I actually made a couple of uh, notes on, on um, the presentations, and I would like to highlight uh, some aspects of it, which actually makes it a really good practice, not only for curling clubs, but for the sport for development community in general, so everybody can, can learn from it. So first of all, uh, my colleagues who work in sport for development and peace and joined us today can, I think, agree with me that it's really rare that a company, a private sector, a stakeholder initiates such uh, a project. Normally, uh, these ideas are coming from local clubs, grassroots organizations, community-based organizations, or individual volunteers, and they actually knock on the door of the corporations to get some funding from them. So it's really rare and extraordinarily special that Go On Like Curling actually initiated this. Um, and the second point is that they immediately reached out to members of the target population. So actually uh, stakeholders from uh, the beneficiaries, from the stakeholders they wanted to support. Because oftentimes, unfortunately, these sport for development initiatives with the best of intentions um, take a neocolonialistic approach and do everything themselves and hand over a basically ready project to uh, their target audience. And it shouldn't be like that. The beneficiaries should be always key parts of the project from start to finish because they know exactly what are their needs and how to approach uh, their community members. So, so far, it's really, really great how it started off. And um, also what is really interesting is that uh, the innovative uh, educational element of using the brush, which is displayed constantly in curling, especially uh, you can see it on TV as well. It's a really, really uh, unique non-formal education tool to spread the message that uh, we've been talking about. And um, a really key aspect, again, is how the profits uh, from this initiative will be actually reinvested and uh, cycled back to the communities to create even more projects, uh, like what the ones that Andrew was talking about. It's really unique, again. And um, 
There's also a concern I would like to share, which I will immediately turn into a hope so we can end up on a positive note. So oftentimes these sport for development initiatives start with great enthusiasm and uh, everybody is on board and everybody is putting 100% of their efforts into it. And once the project cycle is over, people and communities are just left behind. So the sustainability is really, really extremely important. And I'm so grateful for Andrew for having that last slide and emphasizing that he wants, and I'm pretty sure that Goldline Curling as well, wants to continue the great work together. So my wish for the United Big Curl is uh, to sustain, to find a way to make it sustainable and to create as much a spin off projects with uh, members of the local community as possible. Thanks, Marianne. Um, we did have a couple questions from the group. Um, the first one is, uh, would it be possible to expand further on Dr. Norman's thesis about how he talks about bagpipes, Victorian values, possibly being oppressive to the racialized communities? And I, I know Dr. Norman isn't on this webinar. Um, would anyone like to, to speak to these thoughts right now, or maybe we can um, connect Tyler with uh, Dr. Norman at a later time. I won't necessarily speak on behalf of um, Dr. Norman, just because you know, one, I'm not him, but he's 100% right. So those, when you walk in and you see symbols or symbolism that are associated with your culture, that are also racist, like that's a huge problem. Now the work that we're doing with the Black Rock Initiative hopes to address some of that, but th that particular part is so, I would say it's so far ahead of where we need to just to even have a starting point. It's, it is a huge, it is a concern of ours, but that's also down the road. And like I said, I don't want to speak too much for, um, for Dr. Norman as to how he relates to that, but it is a concern. It is a very real issue within the curling communities. Yeah, and I'm not an expert in this at all, but kind of from what I've picked up along the way is that you know a lot of these things that we tie so closely with curling and we're so familiar with curling like bagpipes and um, pictures of people curling on ice outside. Those things are great and they tell the history of our sport, but they don't necessarily um, represent everybody in curling. And maybe that becomes a barrier to entry for people who are coming in. So just something to think about in the future for curling clubs. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind just commenting too. There's some uh, interesting, they become almost tools to some of the curling community, which was conversations that um, Rich had with us at Goldline throughout the summer on Instagram. And he did speak to that. And I just think if there's a, a bit of a, um, a library of some tools in terms of direct conversations with Dr. Rich Norman, uh, we did um, speak to some of the, the more uncomfortable questions. So if you'd like to look into the history of that, I think uh, I've had a few people mention to me, they've been great tools for them. Yes, definitely. Um, I was going to also add, uh, please check out Goldline on social media, especially that Instagram live series. Um, and also check us out on social media, the Global DEI, Global Initiative for DEI and Curling. Um, does anyone have any questions? I think, Katie, you have your hand raised. I'm not sure if you have a question. Um, I can allow you to, to speak if you wish. Um, if you could just shoot me a, a text in the chat to let me know. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, I just wanted to highlight, we had some attendees from um, the Malvern community, somebody who grew up in Malvern. So that's interesting. Um, Marianne provided the uh, attendees with the infographic that you guys saw Oscar holding. So today for April 6th, if you have the opportunity to um, share things that we have out on social media, including that infographic, today is the day to do it. Um, we would really appreciate everybody getting involved on social media. So again, check out Goldline Curling and also the Global Initiative social media for things to share regarding today. Um, what else? Uh, Brody from Curling Canada also shared um, the initiatives that Curling Canada is working on, which is really exciting. Um, we definitely wanna share best practices and resources and 
that may be a good start for curling clubs as well. So thank you for that, Brody. Um, someone else mentioned that during the COVID pandemic, maybe curling clubs will have a bit of a, an instinct to get involved with their local communities. So I, I appreciate that comment. Um, does anyone have any last questions? Let me see. Oh, um, someone asked, what is the best way to contact any of the panelists to continue the conversation? So um, per my personal page, so if you search the curling dad on Instagram or Twitter, you will find me there. You can always send me a direct message and I can give you my email or we can continue the conversation there. Um, same thing applies with the new Black Rock Initiative. Please feel free to follow us and like us on social media. You can always DM us there and again, continue the conversation there. Great. Wonderful. You can reach me at Erin, E-R-I-N, at goldline.ca. And also, um, somebody asked, when will the brooms be available? Ooh. We have a, an incredible partnership with um, the GSOC Grand Slam of Curling uh, group, and we are going to be, actually, Andrew, you know what, I'm going to shoot this over to you. You, this is your baby. So... During their events, which are coming up quick, um, we're going to announce, you still know the whole, whole details of exactly how it's going to go down, but we plan on releasing the um, broom then, and there, shortly thereafter, we'll have it available for pre-orders, and then we're looking to have it in stores and also, of course, all over Goldline's website by the fall. Yes, and just to, to comment, we'll have um, Andrew's brush will be revealed and Graydon's brush. And then a week later, because we, you know, it's the never ending curling, which is exciting in April and May, we'll, we'll be revealing the Deb Martin brush, which is, uh, stay tuned, because they're all very exciting. Okay. We had another question. Um, will any resources from the pilot in Nova Scotia be available in real time or just after consultations and feedback from the stakeholders? So some of it will be available in real time. Um, depending on specifically what it is, um, we're going to want to um, review it and look it over necessarily before we release it all. But like I said, we really want to um, start conversations even outside Nova Scotia so that as we work out the kinks, for lack of a better term, that we can roll them out more broadly to other clubs across Canada. So I sort of straddled the fence on that answer. So yes, some of them will be, and some of them won't be depending on specifically what it is. Any um, last questions from our attendees? Now's your chance. Okay, well, um, I just wanna thank all of you for participating in this, in this webinar. Andrew, it was so exciting to see um, the Black Rock Initiative be released and I love the name and I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. And as always, Goldline, we can't say enough about this project. It's really unique and awesome um, and excited to see what you guys are up to in the future as well. And Marianne, thank you for um, moderating and um, I hope everyone has a good rest of your day and we'll be putting up the recording for this on YouTube. So if you wanna re refer anyone else to see this, please visit us there. Thanks all. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Marianne. Good to see you, Andrew. Thanks everyone. Happy April 6th.